Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Well, thank goodness. Thank goodness for what? Oh, oh, the trouble I've had getting this number of yours. How come? Well, I finally had to call Mr. McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. I found out from him that you're there in Hartford, Connecticut. That's right. Well, I, I thought you were going to drop by and pick up your check. Was I? Well, of course you said you would. Did I? Well, of course. Well, all right, but what's it for, and who are you? Well, well what's it for? Why, why, for your services in connection with that oil refinery investigation you made for us. What oil refinery? When? Well, when? Well, uh, last week. What are you talking about, and who are you, sir? Now, now, look here, Dollar. I'm Ted Beckham, Western Indemnity Company. Now, who else would be calling you regarding... Uh, Ted the... Beckham? Yes, yes, of course. Western Indemnity? That's right, right here in Fort Worth. Now, Mr. Beckham... Now, I've okayed your expense account for that uh, refinery investigation. The check is ready, and I I just want to be sure that you pick it up. Investigation? Look, are you being funny, Dollar? There in Fort Worth? Yes. Texas? Yes. Now, Mr. Beckham... Yes. The only case I handled last week was right here in Hartford. In what? The week before, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. No, no, well, well, wait the one before that, I was also here in Hartford. Dollar? And before that, in L.A., California. Look, you're Johnny Dollar? That's me. <laughs> well, you're not. I'm not? Well, of course not. How stupid of me. I should have realized you weren't Johnny Dollar the minute you picked up the phone. Now, look, Mr. Well, Beck... your voice, it's not one bit like Dollar. Now, look, will you please listen oh, to... All right, you imposter... You've succeeded in making a fool of me. This bird's off his rocker. But believe me, if I had time, I'd have you tracked down and arrested for impersonating him. Me? Yes. Impersonating? Yes. For impersonating Johnny Dollar. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. Well, same to you and many of them. Radio brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Indemnity Company, to the Greater Southwest Insurance Company, and maybe to Universal Adjustment Bureau. Anyhow, the following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the who's who matter. That wacky phone call from Texas from a man, a company I'd never even heard of, accusing me of impersonating myself. I was about to pick up the phone again, call him back and demand an explanation, but the phone beat me to it. Hello? That's a pleasant sort of greeting. Hmm? Pat McCracken, Johnny. Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, Pat. Uh, did a man named Beckham reach you? Well, he certainly did. Who is he? All I know is that he's heading up an outfit called Western, Western Indemnity, Indemnity Company. Company. Yeah, that's right. It's in Fort Worth. It's one of the many new insurance outfits there in Texas. And, well, that's really just about all I know about it. I see. But uh, Beckham seemed anxious to get in touch with you, so I gave him your number. And? And if you plan to go on down there, Johnny... Well, I certainly do. Well, fine, because I just got a call from Al Pinker at the Greater Southwest Insurance Office. Al Pinker? Yes, regarding an arson job there in Dallas. The uh, Geary Brothers Department Store. Go on. So, uh, if you can hop a plane right away and look it over before the ashes get too cold... A pat. But, of course, if this this man Beckham has something that's going to tie you up... Well, uh, what do you think? Don't give it a second thought, Pat. I'll handle them both. Good. Yeah, I'll kill two birds with one stone. Fine. Did I say kill? What? Well, I hope not. But who knows? Why? Pat, I'll be in touch. Al Pinker in Dallas. Ted Beckham in Fort Worth. Expense account item one, 9805 airfare. The plane set down at the Amon Carter Field in Fort Worth. It was late in the afternoon. And item two is ten bucks even for a taxi for the 19-mile drive into the city, into the Western Indemnity Building. It was brand new, very modern, very small, and located on East Lancaster Avenue. 
Over the protest of a pretty young blonde secretary with pale blue eyes and a... <clears throat> well, I, uh, I bullied my way into Beckham's office. Uh, yes, who are you? All right, now, Mr. Beckham, let's get a few things straight. Now, wait a minute. I asked you, young man, who are you? What do you mean, barging in this way? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Jo ah, don't. Be ridiculous. Here are my credentials, including photograph and fingerprints. Here, look them over. All right. Huh? Well, now, this, uh, uh... Well? Why, you... You are Johnny Dollar. You are Johnny Dollar. That's right. And your voice, the same one I talked to over the phone early this morning. Right. But I... I made that call to Hartford. That's right. Oh, you, you were in Hartford then. Huh? Yes, but I am here now, and I would like to know what this is all about. Well, that, uh, that other young man who's been working with us did a couple of investigations for us. You better tell me about him. Why, he said that he's John Dollar. Oh, he did, huh? And with that unusual name, there couldn't be two John A. Dollars. Well, it's not likely. But knowing all about you and your fine work over the years, well, uh, when he came here and offered to undertake the two investigations, and there's a third one, that, uh, and he did do a good job for us, Mr. Dollar. He did, huh? And yet, when I got his expense account, or that is, uh, when I looked it over again after talking with you on the telephone, well, it kind of made me suspicious. The size of it, I mean, you see? Yeah. That expense account of his. Well, tell me this, Mr. Beckham. Just why did you call me this morning? Well, that was it. About the expenses for your... Well, I mean, for his job on that refinery investigation. Now, he said he'd pick up the money here. He never had given me his address, and... Well, I'd okayed the account, and the money was here waiting for him, and... Uh, but then, knowing so much about you, as I said, and, and contemplating the... The amount of his expense account... Well, so you I... tracked down my number in Hartford and called me? Yes. To have me pick up the money? Yes, and uh, because I suddenly had a small suspicion, I... I mean because of the total of that expense account. Mr. Dollar... All right, Mr. Beckham. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Miss Carroll? Uh, there's a Mr. Albert Pinker here to see you. Pinker? Uh, send him in, Carol. Yes, sir. Hello. Who is Albert Pinker? Greater Southwest Insurance Company. Al just happens to be the other reason I came all the way out here to Texas. Johnny! Hi, Al. Meet Ted Beckham. Heads up this office. Oh, glad to meet you, Ted. Hi, uh, Mr. Pinker. Uh, Pat McCracken said you might come here first, Johnny. But listen, is whatever you're here for something that can wait? Well, now, I'm not exactly sure. Because if you can come on over to Dallas with me right away, this department store... Uh, wait a minute. The, the Geary Brothers Department Store, Mr. Pinker? Yeah, that's right. You know about it? Well, I certainly do. You see, we hold part of that insurance, too. Oh? Uh, as a matter of fact, this other Johnny Dollar, why, he... This what? Uh, he... Beckham, perhaps I'd better go on over there with Al. Yes, but now, Dollar, this, this yeah, is... Yeah, well, all right, now, just this... don't get yourself all lathered up. I'll check up on our little affair later. Oh, good, but uh, what did Ted mean about another... Uh, well, that is... Well, Al, it seems that I've come here to run down two people. Two? That's right. You're a firebug for one. Yeah, Johnny? And a guy named Johnny Dollar. <laughs> what? February is observed as American Heart Month for the sobering good reason that heart diseases take more lives than any other cause of death. This month is set aside for an appeal for funds to support a growing research program, enlisting top medical and scientific minds in the battle to overcome untimely death. The results of past generosities have already been felt in hospitals and doctors' offices and in lives saved. New techniques in surgery now save countless lives daily, here and elsewhere, because you gave for experiment into the then mysterious area of heart penetration. The money you give this year may be directly instrumental in raising the annual quota of people made whole, of lives saved, of families spared tragedy. When your Heart Fund volunteer calls, be generous, for this is a moving, pressing cause. Give to help your heart fund, help your heart, and the hearts of those you love. During the 30-odd mile drive from Fort Worth to Dallas, I told Al Pinker about my own little problem. 
about this somebody who was impersonating me. And he was highly amused, which is more than I was. And then he told me about the arson job at Geary Brothers Department Store. And quite frankly, it sounded like something the police and a couple of private investigators working on would have been able to solve in short order. However, I agreed to look into it for him. He got me settled at the Statler Hilton, bought me cocktails and dinner, and then left me his car, suggested I have a good night's sleep and contact the police department first thing in the morning. Well, I could have used the sleep all right, but instead, after he'd left, I decided to have a look-see at the remains of the department store before getting anyone else's opinion on the direct cause of the fire. It was in one of the new development areas far out on the edge of town. There was nobody about watching the place, so I proceeded to look around. It seems the building was a two-story affair. The fire had been pretty well contained on the second floor. A lot of damage had been done to the furniture section, household goods and appliances, that sort of stuff. Most of the roof was gone, and I found I had to be careful not to fall through several badly charred spots on the floor. Foolishly, I'd forgotten to bring along a flashlight. And although there was a moon, I had a problem locating the exact spot where the fire started, or rather where it was set. But as I shoved aside a piece of fallen timber that blocked my way into what was obviously a storeroom for bedding materials, Who's there? I did have my gun with me. Who's there? Oh, that was clumsy. I dove to the floor behind some kind of a box, a packing case. But all I could hear was the roar of traffic out on the highway. That is, until whoever it was. So there you are. But I couldn't see him. Or more important, what sort of protection he had. I only knew that if he came around a little more to my left, this packing case would be no protection for me at all. Hey! Then nothing. Not another sound. But because he had come around at the side... He obviously knew more about the geography of the store than I did. So unless I got out of there, found some better protection... All right, mister, you better give up. You hear me? Because I know exactly where you are. You hear me? Stand up with your hands up over your head where I can see you against the light. You hear me, mister? What are you, don't... To my right, clearly outlined against the sky, was something, another packing case maybe, that was bigger, heavier than the one that now gave me a scant protection. If I could feel my way over to it. You hear me? You're coming out of there. You, you hear those sirens? Yeah, yeah, I hear them. Well, okay, then. So I'm pushing this little steel desk in front of me, and I'm coming over there to get you. I made a dash across the floor, but I forgot about the rotten, burned-out flooring that... Oh, no! When I came to, it could only have been seconds later, I found myself lying painfully on the concrete level below the hole in the burned-out flooring above. My gun was gone. And, yeah, so was everything else that I'd had in my pockets. I tried to get to my feet... I couldn't quite make it. And it wouldn't have done me any good if I had. Here he is, right over here. Put your light on him, Mackenzie. Right you are. There. Yeah, just to make sure he don't start shooting again. Oh, now listen to me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> The cleaner the tobacco, the better it tastes. And in Commander, the tobacco is vacuum cleaned. Have a Commander. Welcome aboard. Try new king-size Philip Morris Commanders made on a new machine, the Mark 8, that takes rich, full-flavored tobacco and... 
gently vacuum cleans it. And the cleaner the tobacco, the better it tastes. Noticeably better. The cleaner the tobacco, the better it tastes. And in Commander, the tobacco is vacuum cleaned. Have a Commander. Welcome aboard. time when I came to, it was on a cot in a small bare room at police headquarters. It was morning. A patrolman sat with his chair cocked across the narrow doorway. I played possum for a while to get my strength and senses back. But then, a few minutes later, when he saw me move a bit... Sergeant, looks like he's come too. Okay, McKenzie. Fallon just brought in the stuff we missed last night. His gun, the papers that were lying around him. Go take a look at him. Let me know what you find. Yes, sir. I'll take a look. All right now, mister. What were you doing out there at the Geary store last night? Now, listen to me. A little looting, maybe? Listen to me, will you? Sure, I'll listen. I'm a special investigator. Oh, sure. Just like all the rest of the crooks, we've had to keep chasing away from that place. No, now listen, Sergeant. The only investigator we got any use for is that young fellow from the insurance company that found the clue last night to pin that arson job on Jerry Springer. You mean you found out? Yep. Springer. Professional torch man from up north. Now, look. Now, I hate to admit it, but it was this young investigator found it out for us. So what happens? Just when he's about to come in and report to us, you sneak up on him and try to blow his head off. What's the name of that investigator? Well, not that it's going to make any difference to you by the time we get through with you, mister, but his name is Johnny Dollar. Sergeant! Hey, Sergeant! What's the matter, Mac? This uh, the stuff we missed out there in the dark last night. Well, what about it? Somebody pulled them out of this man's pockets. Pulled what out? Well, here, of... these credentials. Picture of them and everything. Uh-huh. Sure. This man. This man's Johnny Dollar. Dollar? That's right. Well, that, that, invest, that, that, that other man, he told us he was Johnny Dollar. We had no reason so maybe to... maybe if he took you in, as well as the insurance company... Well, uh, Mr. Dollar... Maybe uh... I had better run him down for you. Yeah, and for me, too. Something I'd learned the day before gave me a pretty good idea or I might find my impersonator. But only if I got there fast, about the time the insurance office back in Fort Worth opened up. In the car I'd borrowed from Al Pinker, I made the 34 miles in 34 minutes. The front door of Western Indemnity was locked, but slipping the latch on it turned out to be a cinch. <laughs> the door of an insurance company yet. I parked myself in the chair of the receptionist who had brushed me off the previous afternoon. And then I noticed the envelope, there on the desk, addressed to Johnny Dollar. Inside of it was a check for expenses on a job that I had never done. I tucked it back into the envelope, and then... We've been wondering where you were and when you were coming in. Oh, there now, as soon as I turn on the lights, we'll be ready for business. There. You're awfully early, though. Are you going to wait and talk to Mr. Beckham when you... You. That's right. Now, you listen here, Mr. Whatever your name is. How did you get in here? And Mr. Beckham isn't here yet, but when he comes in and finds out that you... Oh, here, Mr. Dollar, here's your check. That's fine, thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me. Dollar, did you say your name is Dollar? That's right. Yes, Mr. Whoever you are, this is Johnny Dollar, the famous investigator. No, he is. And if you think you'll get away with breaking into this office... Johnny Dollar. Now, listen, buddy. You should have taken a better look at me last night. What? You mean... Yeah, I mean... You mean that you... Uh, Carol, thanks for the check. I, I gotta go... Oh, no, you don't. Oh, don't I? No, that gun. That's right. Now, get over there beside him, Carol. What? Oh, I... Ow! Okay, now. Now, listen to me. And don't try any tricks, Dollar. Dollar? Are you forgetting the police know who I am now, know who you aren't? He called you Dollar. The police? Over there in Dallas? Do you think they'll waste any time telling the department here in Fort Worth? By the time those cops get the word, I'll be far, far away. Now, Will listen. somebody please tell me what's going on You here? made a big mistake in leaving my credentials here beside me last night. So I made a mistake, because the cops were coming. But I'm not making any this time. Now, listen Do to me. Do you mind telling me why you decided to pose as me? Please, somebody explain. Wait, how long you thought you'd get away with it? Dollar. And I suppose you solved a couple of cases for this company, got yourself in good with them, because you planned the crimes, whatever they were. Okay, Maybe Dollar. even pulled them off yourself. Okay, okay, you're stalling for time, but it's no good. And tell me this. Quiet, both of you. Now, 
Now, both of you walk into that coat closet there beside you. You lock us into that... Uh... Now, listen, mister. Go ahead, or dollars to help me out. Pull this trigger. Go on. Look. Yeah, look behind you. Now, don't try that old gag. Oh, my goodness. What's going Beckham. on? Beckham. What, what's going on in This, here? Mr. Beckham. Oh. Why, why, Mr. Dollar, you... You found him. Yeah, Mr. Beckham. I found him. Well, somebody please tell me what this is all about. And the next time somebody barges in and identifies himself as me... Oh, now, but I tried to tell you, Mr. Dollar. I tried to tell you yesterday. You that... tried to tell me what? Well, I suspected this man from the minute I got his expense account on those jobs he presumably did for us. Why, well, that was one of the reasons for calling you in Hartford. What do you mean, Mr. Beckham? Well, uh, knowing all about you, in spite of never having met you... And then, seeing the amount of his expense account... He handed in a pretty heavy one, huh? Well, that's just the point. No. What's that? Well, it was so small. I just knew that he couldn't really be you. Okay, then, Mr. Beckham. On the strength of that last remark, I will not expect you to question this. Expense account total, including hotel, transportation back to Hartford, and all the incidentals I could possibly cook up, 30625. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fireman. The dangerous kind. That carefully sets fires instead of putting them out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Reddick is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced by Bruno Zerato Jr. Directed by Ed Oates. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Ian Martin as Ted Beckham, Phil Sterling as Al Pinker, Lawson Zerby played Pat McCracken. Bill Lipton was the police officer, Rosemary Rice was Carol, Roger DeCoban was the sergeant, Leon Janney was the man. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. How many times do you drive along the highway at a pretty fast clip and come upon a policeman at the side of the road writing out a ticket for some unfortunate traffic law violator? What happens? Almost automatically, you slow down to a sensible speed and pay more attention to driving safely. Nobody likes to get a traffic summons, but it's only by even stricter law enforcement that we're ever going to cut down on the shocking and shameful death and accident rate on our highways. That's why we should all get behind local and state safety programs and support any measures that will make driving a pleasure instead of a risk. A proper safety program includes not only more rigid enforcement of traffic laws and stiffer penalties for violating them, but also better public in education on safer, saner driving habits and the elimination of dangerous stretches of highway. The surest way to cut down on accidents, though, is for all of us, motorists and pedestrians alike, to be more careful and more sensible about how we drive and walk.